Welcome to Network Marketing Pro. My name is Eric Worre, and today I'm here with Cedric Harris. Cedric. Here. How you doing? I'm awesome, my friend. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing I appreciate you coming Thank all you, the way here to Las Vegas to sit down and have a little conversation with me. Thank you for having me, my friend. It's my, my great pleasure. And Cedric is a million dollar a year earner. Uh, he's been involved in the profession for a number of years. We're going to learn a little bit about his story. But I'm a firm believer that success leaves clues. And uh, there's nothing I like more than digging in a little bit and finding out what, what makes this person different than somebody who isn't making a million dollars a year. What, what can we all learn from your experiences, from the things that have worked in your business and things that have been successful. So I hope you enjoy our conversation together. But Cedric, why don't you start? I don't know a lot about your story. Okay. Um, prior to network marketing, where'd, where'd you where'd you come from? What was your what was your upbringing like? Uh, what was your what was your life like prior to network marketing? Uh, great question, Eric. It was an interesting interesting life. I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, in, in the South. Um, I was lucky enough to be raised by someone who understood the sales game, who was also a butcher at a grocery store. So my dad actually sold CBs on the side. He was really, really big in CB radios. Like Breaker Breaker one Absolutely, nine. absolutely. His wow. handle was Amazing Spider-Man, you know, so he talked to people all over the world. Obviously, fast forward 20 plus years later, the CBs don't exist anymore. Right. But uh, I watched my dad sell a lot of CBs to a lot of his friends, and I started to learn the sales process back then. And then uh, I, I will tell you that when I was in the 10th grade, when I was in the 10th grade, I started selling candy. Hmm. And I got really, really good at it. Now was this like, uh, like a school fundraiser type no, of thing? No, it or? was a Cedric Harris fundraiser. Uh, so it wasn't <laughs> it for was, the band? It wasn't for the... the band, it wasn't for the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, it was for my pockets. So, so you, go, you, you go buy it and mark it up? Absolutely. So my dad, he worked at a grocery store. So I told my dad one day to bring me home a bag of blow pops. Okay. And he bought me home a bag of blow pops and I sold those blow pops. And then I started buying Boston baked beans and now laters and snicker bars. And before you know it, you're a candy know, store. I was a candy store, you know, and how'd I, you carry all this candy? I had a big duffel bag. I, so I had my regular book bag then I had a duffel bag that had all my candy in it. So literally 10th grade, 11th grade, that's how I, that's how I fed myself, really, because ironically, Eric, one day my mom, I grew up in a neighborhood whereas it was my mom and my father, and about five minutes from my neighborhood was the projects. And that's really where I quote unquote grew up at, all my friends and family and sure. everybody that I knew. And uh, I was at home counting the money one day, and I counted out $110, and my mom walked in the door, and my mom said, Where'd you get all that money from? Uh, first thing, first thought in her yeah, mind is, yeah, where'd yeah. you get all that money from? And I'm like, selling candy. She says, you didn't make that much money selling candy. I said, yes, I did. She said, you made $110 selling candy. And I said, yeah. She said, well, I make $500 a week, so you don't need me anymore. So no more school clothes, no more Michael Jackson jackets, no more AJ jeans. No more Michael, none of that stuff. You're so on you your own. earned yourself on your, on your own. 15 years old, I was on <laughs> It wasn't extra money anymore. It wasn't extra money anymore. I, I had no choice. I had no wow. choice. It was the best thing entrepreneurially, though, that my mother could have ever did. Huh. The best thing, because from that point, I was an entrepreneur. I you had were, to do it, and I was on commission. thinking independently. Absolutely. You weren't so. looking for any allowance. No, there was no allowance. It wasn't coming. No. The only benefit I had was my dad worked at the grocery store and he didn't even get a discount on the, on the candy. So yeah. he was just the guy that delivered it to me. <laughs> that was wow. it, that was it. But it, uh, it changed my life. Uh, I still thank my mom to this day of her cutting me off and, and basically putting me out of my own. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so what a great lesson. Yeah, it, it, it taught me a lot, so that. that so, so 10th and 11th grade, you, you become this, uh, the candy king of what's the high school? George with High School. George with High School in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah, so you're the can candy king of that school. I'm the candy king of that school. And what, until if, what if somebody else started coming in and selling candy? They were. I wasn't On your the territory. only one. I wasn't the only one. No? I wasn't the only one. There was other people selling candy, but there was enough money to go around for all of us, just like a network market. There's <laughs> enough money to go around for all of us. Every kid has a sweet tooth in high school, so there was enough money to go around for all of us. So all it right. all worked out. It all so worked what out. happened next? Uh, my candy bag got repossessed. What? You know, one day. One, one day, the, uh, the assistant principal came to me and said, uh, hey, Cedric, I heard you're the candy man. And, uh, 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 and he said, hey, let me see that book bag. And he took my book bag, and he whipped out a blow pop, and he ate one. And he said, if you ever sell candy again, I'm going to expel you. 
And I said, wow, man, I've been, I've been feeding myself doing this. <laughs> you know, so uh, that ended my candy career. <laughs> wow. Know? That ended my candy career. Um, I ended up going to a school that was an alternative school. What was the problem with selling candy? In the well, you're not supposed to sell candy. Maybe that was back in the 90s. Yeah, I don't but know. maybe I suppose it's probably the same thing, to, same thing today. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. And it was very lucrative for me. You know, so when he did that, you want to talk about like, sinking my battleship. Bam. You know, so. Uh, Your own little personal high school recession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was a, it was a life changer because I had to explain it to my mom because my mom cut me off two years prior. <laughs> so it was yeah. like, you're on your own, like, figure it out. You know, so uh, actually I got into the clothing business. You know, I, I got hired at a clothing store called Cavalier's Men's Shop. Let me, let me ask you a question before you go to the clothing store. Sure. Were you ever, because you had friends that lived in, in areas where they sold other stuff, mm -hmm. were you ever tempted? Tempted, I did it. Ah. Tempted, I, I, I lived that life. Ah. I mean. When? After high school or no? Actually, ironically, as soon as my candy bag got repossessed, I had $27 to my name. Right. And my mother said, you were on your own, so I had a choice. Right. I got $27. What do I do? Right. You know, so I invested. You're, you're used to selling stuff. Yeah, I invested that money. Huh. <laughs> and I invested, and I invested, and I invested. Because your, your environment's a, an incredibly powerful thing. Absolutely. And you're going to reach out to where, where opportunity presents itself, right? You know, That's what you can do. It's the old adage of you become the top, you become the top five people you spend the most time with. Yeah. You know, and the top five people I spent the most time with were pharmaceutical salespeople. You know, so yeah, yeah. I became number six. Uh, you know, and I, I learned very quickly that that wasn't the, the place where I was supposed to be. You know. What, what, what uh, changed your mind about that? A guy in a black robe. Hmm. <laughs> a guy in a black robe that controlled my life. Hmm. That, at, that at one point, um, I could have been looking at 10 years. And he, he said, I'm going to give you a shot. You know, and I, I went what do you mean? Oh, oh, so you're talking the judge, okay. Yeah, the judge, I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. So he, he, he gave you a chance. He gave me a chance. And I actually went to a 90-day boot camp program. Huh. And that 90-day boot camp program changed my life, Eric. I was 18 years young, and 42 of us went into this boot camp program, and 12 of us came home. Wow. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Wow. You know, and it was very humbling. Um, I tell people all the time, I never ran, you know, never jogged or anything. We were running 15, 20 miles a day, you know, crazy push-up sit-ups. We had to work eight, 10 hours a day. Everything was strenuous. You know, we were on schedule five o'clock in the morning. It was ran like a military, mm. but it was for people who did things that they weren't supposed to do. Yep. And uh, it was one of those things of you can either quit or you can get put out. Mm. And on day one, I would say about 10 people quit because it was so hard. Hmm. And he said, I'd, I'd just rather go to jail. I'm not going to do this. And wow. I'm like, you guys are crazy. I'm going home in 90 days. <laughs> you yeah. know? So uh, it was, it was, it was life changing. September, September 23rd, 1994. Wow. Yeah. 1994. That's Saved when, my life. That's, that's when I walked out of that boot camp program. So you walk Life's out of there, free man. I walk out of there, change free man. man. Change man. In shape, man. In shape, still jogging for no reason. You know, yeah. getting up at five o'clock in the morning for no reason. You yeah. know, and it was uh, you, it was humbling. There's some discipline connected to this entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah, has some discipline. And one of the things I tell people all the time in, in the network marketing industry, you know, your background can assist you in your future at the same time because ironically, because of what I went to boot camp for, nobody wanted to give me a job. Hmm. And I was a great salesperson before I went into boot camp. I sold clothes. I was the top salesperson at the clothing store that I was at. So much so that when, when I started that boot camp process, and my, the manager got me out because I was so valuable at ah. the store. He was like, no, Cedric can't be there. He got me out, you know, and uh, nobody would hire me. Mm. And I'm like, this, this sucks, you know. And then finally I got another job in another clothing store, propelled there, got into uh, food sales at a company called American Frozen Foods, and I ran a sales team there. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got introduced to network marketing, when mm -hmm. I was running that, that food service company. You know, we were selling four, five, six months worth of food to homeowners at one point, at one time, in a $2,000 freezer, yep. and it was a one-call close. I had 14 salespeople. We covered Richmond, Virginia. You know, and I started off selling there, and I got really good, and they made me a manager, so I overrode everybody, went out in the field, taught them how to close, all that good stuff. And uh, it was awesome, and one day, a good friend of mine, one of my sales guys, he walked in and he says, hey, I met this guy. 
you really need to talk to him. And I'm like, I need to talk to him about what? He introduced me to this thing called Excel Communications. Like mm -hmm. I told him, I'm not interested, but I told him that you might be. Mm. And ironically, the next day, he tried to cancel his food service. Mm. And when somebody tries to cancel, they have the three-day rescission. They've got to talk to me before it happens. Right. And I'm like, hey, you know, before we think about canceling this, I don't want to come out to your house and talk to you about that. <laughs> you know? So uh, I actually came out to the home, saved the deal. Uh -huh. Then he introduced me to Excel. And that was my introduction to network marketing. So that you got, you got connected there. Did, were you excited right away? Were you resistant? Ex, ex, I was actually extremely excited. What, ex, what excited you? Was it uh, the, the, you know, just kind of the, the power of the compensation plan? or At the time in the 90s when I sat down with him, you know, uh, I'm not gonna get too deep into income because we love this industry, but yeah, yeah. you know, there were so many people making exuberant amounts of money and then it was residual. Right. And everybody had a telephone. Right. You know, so when he explained so it to Just me, so everybody knows, this is a company, it's called Excel Te uh, Telecommunications, that, um, that sold long distance service yeah. back when people were paying 10 to 25 cents a minute yeah. for long distance. Um, and then they eventually sold to another larger company and the network marketing aspect of it disappeared. But, yep. um, but they, they, a lot of my friends you know, uh, um, started there yeah. and had some good success there. And it then, was the easiest thing I've ever done. Mm. It was so easy because everybody had a telephone. Easier than candy? It was. It, it, no, okay, all right, candy was easy. <laughs> I, 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 I'll take that one back. I'll take that one back. Candy was easy. All right, it was, yeah, it was sugar, yeah. sugar. That was yeah, easy. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, what got me excited? Everybody had a telephone, mm -hmm. and I knew that all I had to do was get an autograph. Right. And I was used to selling and collecting money. Right. So to know that all I had to do was get an autograph and they just switched their long distance from AT&T to Excel, they mm -hmm. charged 20 cent a minute, Excel's doing it for 10 and all we had to do was mail in the form. Mm -hmm. It was, it was lay down bill. I mean, we went out and created a team. I mean, we even were door knocking, talking to everybody that we knew, we, we didn't care. So right. it, was, it was extremely exciting. So you move forward, since that day, have you, have you done anything else other than network marketing? Yeah, yeah. Um, did Excel, and then just like you said, the, the long distance portion, the sale, well, the, the networking side went yep. away about a year, a year later. And uh, ironically, I ended up in the mortgage business. Mm. You know, so I got in the mortgage business. I answered the ad in 2001. I said, this will be the last job you'd ever take in your life. And I said, yeah, right. You know, and I showed up at the interview thinking that there was going to be a Kirby vacuum cleaner showing up or something crazy. And the guy told me, uh, we do mortgages. The company happened to be the largest VA mortgage lender in the nation. I didn't know anything about mortgages at the time, mm -hmm. but it was a one call close. So all we did was run leads, sit down with the homeowner, close them on the spot. That, that was the deal. Mm -hmm. And I uh, became the number two loan officer in the country in about six, seven months. The owner thought it was a fluke. So he shot me around in different states to see if I could do it there. And I did it there. And then he promoted me to management and uh, it changed my life. I mean, dramatically promoted me to management moved me to Detroit, Michigan. Lived in Detroit, Michigan for about a year and a half. They Where were, in Detroit? Um, I lived in West Bloomfield. I had an office in Southfield. So yeah. my office was right in Southfield. Southfield. Yep, yep, so my office, Civic Center Drive. Nine and a half mile, Mount Vernon. Okay, 20300 Civic Center Drive. <laughs> yeah, I, still, I still remember the address. All right, yeah. All right. yeah, so so office Southfield, lived in West Bloomfield, ran that office there. Um, and then I, I got the phone call that changed my life. You know, my, uh, my old boss called and says, uh, Hey, I need you to go to Richmond. And I'm from Richmond. Richmond was our largest office. And he said, uh, I need you to go fix the office. And I said, what's wrong with it? He said, it's broke. They're closing less than 40%. Bob is driving me crazy. And Bob was the guy who trained me. So it was kind of like Ralph Macchio telling Mr. Miyagi what to do. Right. And he says, I need you to go. And I said, well, when am I going? He said, tonight, I've already booked your flight. And I'm like, tonight? He says, yeah, tonight, get on the plane. So I went on a plane and went to Richmond and told Bob why I was there. And I went and fired half the people that were there in 48 hours, started over, retrained everybody. And uh, once the closing ratio got up to 70 plus percent in two and a half weeks, you know, the boss man called and fired Bob on the spot and said, take over the, take over the office. Mm. And it was life changing. It was 2003, you know, we did uh, over a billion dollars in loans that year, you know, and, and you know, I had a, that was my first seven figure year. I was 27 years old. It was my first seven-figure year, and I thought the sky was going to part. Mm. You know, I mean, and I, I thought it was going to be like that forever. Forever, but until 2008. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, really, it was, for us, um, all we did were VA loans. Oh, okay. So I would say two, 2006 is when I stepped away. Yep. Um, 
started to dry up. Yeah, we went from 28 offices down to 13. We went from 1,100 loan officers down to 60 plus. You know, we went from having fun to being depressed. Mm -hmm. You know, you went from guys making a lot of money to now hiding their cars, yeah. you know, and like, hey, is, is this ever gonna stop? And then my old boss told me, he said, Cedric, you need to call all the managers and let them know it's gonna rain. I keep trying to tell these guys to stop buying everything every two weeks. It's gonna rain. I've never seen interest rates this low before ever in my life. It's impossible for it to stay this way. They're giving people houses with a business card with and no a pulse. documentation. Yeah, yeah. They, they got a pulse and they're giving them a, a, a house. It's not gonna stay this way. And he was right. So uh, I, I remember taking a trip to the Bahamas and I'm laying on the beach and I'm looking around and I'm like, wow, people actually make 150, 200 grand a year and they take two weeks off. And I haven't taken a, a, a weekend off for five years. And I said, I'm done, this, I'm, I'm, I'm just toast. My brain was just on mush. So uh, I came back and said, okay. And I told my old boss, I said, I love you, but I can't do it anymore. I said, once this starts to feel like work, I can't do it anymore. And now mm. it feels like work. It's been fun for five and a half years. Now it feels like work. And he says, well, you haven't made enough money. He said, I'm still here and I'm mm. worth hundreds of millions. You, you, haven't, you haven't made enough money. What are you going to do? I said, I don't Something. know. I don't but you know. had enough confidence in yeah, yourself. Yeah, and I had a nice you can sell. bank account. So I said, yeah. I, I, could do, I could do this again, and I know how to sell, and that's the one skill set that nobody can take from me. And I said, I can do it again. Yeah. So uh, I, that's when I got back into network marketing. I said, I'm not going back to work. I was psychologically unemployable. So you go through this whole process, this whole odyssey. You find yourself back in network marketing. Mm -hmm. And today, you know, in the, in the rare air, uh, the top... 1%, um, maybe even higher than that, six figures a month, a million a year. Um, I've heard some things that probably differentiate you from the average person already, just in our conversation, mm -hmm. as far as your, your willingness to work, hustle, um, your, your sales ability, your belief in yourself. What do you think separates you from the average? Uh, what makes you so special? Why are you a million dollar a year guy? I know it's not timing and I know it's not luck. Um, what's, what, what's different about you? I mean, if you could sprinkle magic dust on everybody that you meet and give them what you have in order to be able to be a high income producer in this profession, what would it be? I wake up every morning starving. Too many people get to a certain financial level and then all of a sudden they think they made it. And when I was in the mortgage industry, my old boss proved to everybody that we didn't make it because he was worth so much money. And I said, there's so much more. There's just so much more. So I wake up every morning starving. You know, and I always tell people, wake up and act as if your downline doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's great that it does, but wake up and act like it doesn't exist because if you are codependent on it existing, then you might become complacent. So I wake up hungry, starving every single day and I'm gonna go at it every single day that's number one mm -hmm. and then number two when I was in the mortgage industry for so long I traveled all over the world and we had to do a lot of turnover calls TO calls mm -hmm. you know that I had to close a lot of the homeowners before the loan officer would actually leave the home that mentally trained me for three-way calls uh. so I, nobody can drown me with three-way calls. I mean, we did so many TOs, you know, mortgage in, interest rates were three and a half, four percent. So the phone was just ringing every two seconds. So psychologically, I can just continue to take call after call after call after call after call. So you know, that doesn't tire you out because no, you're prepared for it. It's not work. Yeah, it's not work. That's, so many people, they, they, they attach it to work. And, and work is something that you do when you'd rather be doing something else. That's right. not work. Right. Me getting on talking to somebody on the telephone, that's not work. That's, that's a joke, that's nothing. You know, me, that person doesn't know me. I just met them five seconds ago. You know, the worst thing they can do is hang up the phone. I'm not gonna lose my eyebrows. You know, I'm not gonna have a handicap sticker in my car. All right. they said was no. You know, so I don't look at it as work. You know, so uh, that, that mental, quote unquote, training in the mortgage industry, I think set me up, you know, for where I'm at today. Okay. You know, and, and that hunger. Mm -hmm. of knowing that there's, there's so much more. And then also my kids, hmm. you know, when all the dust settles, I've got this thing, I've got girls. I've got one son and, and two girls, and I've got this thing that, that I read a long time ago that 80 plus percent of women end up with a man similar to their 
to similar to their father if they grew up with their mother or father. Hmm. 80 plus percent. So I want to make it hard. I want to make it hard for the guys who might end up with my daughters because they have to raise their bar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've graduated one from college. You know, she's, she's ironically, my oldest is a school teacher at the middle school I went to middle school at, and she's a cheerleading coach at the high school I graduated from. Mm. So that's pretty cool. And then my youngest is, is, is you know, psychology major at, 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 uh, at uh, Old Dominion University. But I want to make it hard, you know, and, and I know that I've got to provide for them. I know that I don't want them to be concerned so it's, about it. So it's part of your reasons? Absolutely. As far as what the, that's what drives you? Absolutely. To do what you need Absolutely. to do? Absolutely. And I would say that having that attitude of knowing that I've got people that depend on me separates me. Hmm. My mom depends on me. My, my father depends on me. My kids depend on me. Versus having a mindset where you're depending on somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I bet you don't depend much on your upline. No. No. Or anybody else. You know, you know what I always tell people, Eric? It's so funny you say that. I say, you know, when your mortgage payment shows up, whose name is on it? Yours or your upline? Yeah. You know, when my kids call me and ask me for money, they don't ask me anything about my upline. Right. <laughs> they say, Dad, <laughs> can I have this? You know, when it was time to pay the college tuition to do these things, it had nothing to do with my upline. You Isn't know? it so nice to be I able to provide? Upline, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Life changing, for sure. The other thing that I've seen that I respect with you, some people, when they get to... Not, not all, I'm, the legends in network marketing don't do this, but the people who get to million dollars a year for the first time, this is their first time, they become a little cool. Mm -hmm. They're like, they're, they're looking down from the mountain on all of their admirers and followers and they're blessing people from time to time with a phone call or something. Um, and they lose their scrappiness, they lose their they're starving, mm -hmm. right? They're not starving anymore. Mm -hmm. A little fat and happy, mm -hmm. right? You spend a lot of time in living rooms. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not talking in front of thousands. You're talking about staying in the living room. What does that mean? Something I learned growing up very, very humble in Richmond, Virginia. My mom taught me to never, ever, ever forget where I come from. And if I do, God will slap me in the back of the head and remind me really quickly. So I've always eaten that humble pie for number one. Number two, I understand that people are gonna do what I do, not what I say. So if I sit on a mountaintop and preach, go do this, go do that, go do this, go do that, a certain percentage of people will do it. But then there's those people that are like, so what are you doing? And so at the level where I'm at right now, and which I'm nowhere near where I'm, I, I, I'm capable of, when all the dust settles, the magic is in the living rooms. That's, mm. that's, that's where it happens. If, if people can see multiple million dollar earners in numerous different companies all over the world constantly still doing what it took to get them where they are today, then you would be busy for the rest of the year because you would be doing 72 of these interviews every single day. Because yeah. everybody would go out and do it and do it and do it. But just like you said, so many people get to a certain level and they get complacent. And, and this is when the, the income yeah, they do, they do for a minute. They don't, you, you don't stay at a million dollars a year by being complacent. Mm -hmm. You can get there mm -hmm. and get complacent for a minute, for a season, but then you go, oh my gosh. Because right. there's nothing that feels worse than used to be in a million dollar earner. Right, 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 you know? right, right. <laughs> <laughs> like, Absolutely. Oh yeah, he used to, he used right. to, he used to make big money. Mm -hmm. you know, that's painful. Absolutely. Um, I, I also want to, you, you talked about one thing and I want to I address it because I grew up humble, um, beginnings also, right? And you get this, this thing put on you, don't forget where you came from, don't forget where you came from. Now, mm -hmm. people can take that a couple different ways. Mm -hmm. One is, stay humble. Um, you're nobody's big shot. Uh, you're no different than anybody else. You might see things a little bit different, but you know, we're all created by God and all of us have capabilities. Some are choosing to step into it, some aren't. But the other side of don't forget where you came from is people making you feel guilty for being successful. Right. Have you had people when you were growing up, you know, from your friends, your neighborhood, family, whatever, try to make you feel guilty for your success? I've had a little bit of that. Um, I can't say I've given it a lot of attention though. Hmm. You know, and, and the reason I say I, I've had a, a little bit of that, um, 
I'm still in communications with a lot of the people that I grew up with, so they know that I haven't forgotten, you know, where I came mm -hmm, from. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I, I give back to a lot of different communities where I grew up at, mm -hmm. and I like to speak in a lot of different places where, where people uh, maybe have a very, very bad background and don't think that they can make it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I want them to be able to know that they can do it as well. My thing of not forgetting where you come from, how, how it was instilled in me, is that I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, but my mother is from Farmville, Virginia. Farmville is a very, very, very small town, and every two weeks, she would take us there, my brother and myself, where at nighttime, it got dark, dark. Mm. There was no running water. There was an outhouse. There was a spring. We had to walk almost a mile to get spring water. And she did that even though we lived in a home in Richmond, she did that every two weeks and my father would never go with us. My father was like, y'all do that country thing. My, my father didn't grow up in the country. That built so much of you better not ever, ever, ever forget. Like my mom walked to the spring mm. a mile to get water. You know, like they had to go to an outhouse like one o'clock in the morning when it's bats flying around outside, you're like, I hold it until the sun comes up, yeah. you know, like you don't forget. So that was something that was just so instilled in me, you know, and, and then the, the things that I, I had to go through when I was 18, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that made me remember that, uh, hey, you're, you're, things could be taken from you in, in a snap of a finger. They could be taken from you in a snap of a finger. So I can't ever forget any of those things. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that really, really, keep my heart beating yeah I love that um, it takes courage I think sometimes yeah. to come out of a situation that's uh, maybe a rough rough upbringing or whatever I think it takes courage to be willing to take a step when other people are not willing to absolutely and and those and when you take a step and they don't you're not leaving them behind they're staying they're choosing to stay um, that doesn't mean you don't keep continue encouraging them but it also doesn't mean you walk backwards right Right. You know, you get to keep moving forward. Like you say, you don't give it that much power in your mind. Mm -hmm. um, cool. Well, why don't, why don't you do this? Um, the people who are watching here, they want to become network marketing professionals. Right. They're all different backgrounds, walks of life. They might have been successful, top of the mountain people. They might have incredible education. They might have had challenges when they were growing up or challenges today. They're, you know, whether it's single parents or somebody who just lost their job or somebody who's been involved in network marketing for three years, never had a breakthrough, wondering if this is for them. Um, understanding that's a lot of different people, right? right? Uh, there'll be over 100,000 people that watch this. I'd, I'd like you to pretend for a moment that you're in the living room mm -hmm. with them mm -hmm. and it's just the two of you. And they're sincerely asking, what do I have to do to be able to succeed here? Um, and give them the counsel that you would give them one on one. Look, look in the camera and give them that counsel, and uh, and have a moment with them. Cool. So, a couple of things I would say. First of all, I would tell you that you've got to get out of your own way. Too many times we think that our background, our surroundings, where we live, our parents, our kids, our husband, our wife, these are the reasons why we're not successful. So the first thing I would say is number one, get out of your own way. You've got to get out of your own way and get these psychological things that might be going on in your mind. You've got the angel on one shoulder, you've got the devil on another that's whispering in your ear on, can you do this, can you do this, can you do this? So number one, you've got to get out of your own way. Number two, you've got to find a mentor. You've got to find one or two people that, that you can pay attention to that have the results that you want and follow them like a tick on a dog's back. And you can't deviate from that because I tell people all the time, you know, if you wanna be a dentist, who do you learn from? You don't learn from an auto mechanic, you learn from a dentist. If you wanna be the best dentist in Las Vegas, if you wanna be the best dentist in Georgia, if you wanna be the best dentist in Florida, you're gonna to go to the best school or learn from the best apprentice, the best dentist that you can actually learn from and become an apprentice, okay? So you've gotta put in that time to, to do so, okay? Number three, number three, I would tell you that something that, that I've done all my life is that I've been an unequivocal freak for events. And, and I mean that you've got to th immerse yourself into personal development. This business, whether you're selling 
lotions, whether you're selling juice, whether you're selling coffee, whether you're selling skincare, no matter what you're selling, it's personal development with a product attached to it. That's what it is. So since you've got to become the better version of you each and every day, knowing that you've got to progress, if you want to attract bigger people in your life, then you've got to become a bigger person. You've got to become better at your skill sets. You've got to really focus on that personal development. That means that you're going to have to listen to some tapes. You're going to have to read some books. You know, one thing that I learned from a, a Marine partner of mine is that I walked into his room one day and he was actually sleeping. At least I thought he was asleep, but he was sleeping with the ear sets in his head. And I woke him up because it was time for us to go for a jog. And I said, Dave, what are you doing? You sleep with your ear sets in your head. He's like, I sleep every night with my ear sets in my head. And I said, why do you do that? He says, because the body rests, but the brain never sleeps. See, while he's sleeping, he's listening to stuff that's going through his mind over and over and over and over and over again. So if you want to sound like Jim Rohn, you should listen to Jim Rohn while you sleep. You want to sound like Eric Warray and understand the seven skill sets, listen to it while you sleep. Have it be in your car. Have your friends get in your car and go through your CD changer and wonder why there's no music. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times some of our friends have gotten into my car and like, hey, where's the music at? And I'm like, that is music. I don't, that's not music. Yes, it is. It's money music. <laughs> it's money music. I don't know what you're looking for, but it's money music. You see, I don't want to be a rapper. I'm not saying that I don't listen to music. Don't get me wrong. But I don't want to be a rapper when I grow up. Okay, that's not what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be a professional networker and a leader that is impacting lives all over the world. So since that's who I want to be when I grow up, I've got to listen to those types of people. So you've got to do that. That would be probably the biggest thing that I would tell everybody here because there's 30 days in a month, 29 days this year in February, 31 days in some months, and, and there's not gonna be 31 great days in your business. There might not be 31 great days of your life every single month. But the reality of it is, is that if you can elevate a lot of those days by what you control, meaning what you're putting in your mind, versus what other people are putting in your mind. See, somebody on Facebook can be putting things in your mind. Your environment can be putting things in your mind. People in your neighborhood that you don't wanna be around, that you don't wanna be like, they could be putting things in your mind. But the books that you read, the CD sets that you listen to, the mentors that you follow, the events that you attend, that you absorb everything, the notes that you take, that's really creating the compound effect. You know, I, I wouldn't even, I, sitting in your living room, I, I wouldn't even spend a whole boatload of time talking about products or services or whatever you are marketing. Those things are great. You could spend an hour talking to you about a comp plan, but it doesn't mean anything until you start producing. What really means something is you. So becoming the best version of you, focusing on those things there and becoming obsessed with them, like literally becoming obsessed with them. If you become obsessed with success, it has to happen. It, it, it has to happen. But you can't look at it from a, I'm going to give it 10 minutes here. I'm going to give it 30 minutes one week. I'm going to get an hour one week. You've got to become obsessed with it. If you become obsessed with it, you will hit the income levels that you want to hit. But more importantly, you'll be changing lives all over the world because as you change lives all over the world, you're indirectly changing yours. So that's, that's what I would do there. Excellent advice. Thank you very much Thank you, my for friend. paying it forward. Thanks for coming and sharing your ideas and your wisdom and your story. And uh, there's a lot you could get out of this interview. My suggestion is maybe watch it a couple more times, maybe take some notes, put together a little game plan and go out there and make your life what it should be and what it could be, okay? So Cedric Harris, thanks again Thank you, Eric. for uh, sharing. And ladies and gentlemen, our wish for all of you is that you decide to become a network marketing professional, that you decide to go pro, because it is a stone cold fact that we do have a better way. Now let's go tell the world. Everybody have a great day. We'll see you next time. Take care.